Well, thank you. And first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to come uh, to give this talk here in Mainz. Um, so yes, I'll be talking about our efforts in, in creating and, and manipulating uh, magnetic uh, skirmions. <coughs> so, so that I don't forget at the end, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators. So this is a project I did together with uh, Axel Hoffman, and many so of you might have seen, <laughs> may recognize him and have seen uh, almost the same talk by him. And uh, the postdoc working with us at the time, Wang Jun Jiang, who's now at uh, Singwon uh, University. Uh, in, uh, back in China. And we had several other collaborators within Argonne. We had some theoretical support from the University of Hong Kong for micromagnetic simulations. Uh, we're currently collaborating with a graduate student uh, from Bren Noir. And um, the films came out of the group of uh, Kang Wang um, at uh, University of California in Los Angeles. And so although we've heard a little bit about skirmions, I do want to uh, remind everybody the skirmions were experimentally, or the magnetic skirmions were experimentally uh, discovered using uh, neutron scattering. And I like to mention this because for most of my career I've been doing neutron scattering and not the type of work I'm showing here. So it's always nice to see a scattering plot. But basically, uh, in this phase diagram of uh, manganese diselenide, they found this uh, region, the A phase, that was A for anomalous phase, has been uh, found for quite a while in, in uh, systems um, that showed helical and conical phases. And in this small part of the phase diagram with neutron, small angle neutron scattering, they found this six-fold uh, symmetry of diffraction spots. And they were able to correlate this uh, structure uh, to this um, arrangement of, of uh, spins where a hexagonal lattice is formed in these swirling uh, objects that we now call magnetic uh, skirmions. Uh, later TEM measurements from uh, the groups in Japan actually confirmed with Lawrence TEM that these are in indeed, um, this is the, uh, s the spin structure in more detail. That <laughs> you know what, what, should we just continue? It's fine. I don't mind. No, 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 it's, it's, it works now. It works now? Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. So beyond the uh, fundamental interest in skirmions, they're also interesting, and that's the reason I'm here, I guess, is because of their non-trivial topology. So you can uh, take the spins of a skirmion and fold them back onto a single sphere, and this can go with the spins pointing inward or outward. And uh, essentially, um, if all the spins are on, on one single sphere, you have a, um, a unitary a topological charge. Additionally, if you look at the transport um, of electrons flowing um, across the skirmion, I guess, would be one way of saying it, is that they feel this virtual field. That's, it's not a real field, but it's an emergent magnetic field that's about 100 uh, could be as much as 100 Tesla, so this is not a small effect. So the, uh, typically the uh, skirmions are stabilized when you have beyond, of course, the regular uh, Heisenberg exchange interactions, firm, um, you also have a jelusinski moria interaction, which uh, instead of the collinear alignment favors the uh, 90 degree alignment. And these two, and these competing uh, interactions um, allow for the, such uh, um, structures to be stabilized. And one of the um, other advantages of skirmions, and particularly in films, which I'll mention in a minute some more, is that we can uh, move them by combining heavy metals with spin over torques that produce the um, DMI at the interface, but also uh, allow for spin hall effects, like we heard this morning uh, from Stuart Parking's talk, creates a torque that will allow you to m move the skirmions, which would lead to applications. So let's review very slightly what I said a minute ago. Of course we have the Heisenberg exchange, we have uh, the DMI term and of course the Zeeman energy terms and together they allow for the stabilization of uh, skirmion. Now in the bulk materials where they were first discovered, uh, these materials have an intrinsic dilusinski maria interaction. And um, as a result of that, you typically obtain a um, vortex-like skirmion or a block skirmion where you can see uh, within the plane, as it were, the, the, uh, the, s the wall spirals, but inside it's down and outside it's up. 
On the other hand, the, uh, interfa if you have an interfacial DMI, which you can get if you have inversion symmetry breaking at the interface and a combination of a heavy metal with a ferromagnet, so heavy metal and a ferromagnet, um, it was pointed out then you have an interfacial um, DMI which tends to stabilize a Niel skirmion. So now um, this is more like the hedgehog I showed earlier on. So with the, uh, now that this uh, skirmion uh, was found to possibly be very mobile, of course um, it was suggested um, that starting with the, uh, the idea Stuart discussed this morning and, and presented uh, several years ago about this racetrack memory, that idea could be expanded and, uh, or transferred into skirmions where you could conceivably have a skirmion be a bit a one or a zero probably one, and the lack of one would be the opposite um, logical uh, quantity. And uh, since we can move them, you would uh, get the analog of this uh, domain wall based track memory, but now with the skirmions. And the major advantage was seen was that the pinning here in the skirmions should be a lot less than uh, in a wire like this because you don't have edge effects and these are topologically stable objects. Experimentally, the first skirmions were seen at low temperatures with a spin polarized STM. And I won't say too much about this because in two talks <laughs> uh, this will be thoroughly um, presented and explained. But basically with an uh, STM tip, uh, small skirmions, nanoscale skirmions were created um, in a thin film, in a, uh, in a monolayer. And so, uh, and Actually, this paper also showed you they could write any race in a very specific spot, uh, skirmions. So this is very nice. Except when we think of uh, practical applications, of course, we want things at room temperature. So uh, our objective was to see how we could create and manipulate the skirmions um, experimentally um, at room temperature. And then, of course, preferably in common materials, because uh, if you start using elements <laughs> that are expensive, the industry would never be interested. Although, of course, our main interest is um, just to be able to see if we can get things to work. So the rest of my talk will be divided into two uh, sections. And the first section will be the blowing of magnetic skirmion bubbles, and the second, the skirmion hall effect. So we st started studying skirmions in materials that uh, had the ingredients uh, that Stuart also mentioned this morning, uh, a heavy metal, in our case tantalum. Uh, our ferromagnet was cobalt iron boron, and we had the tantalum oxide at top, which promoted the out-of-plane anisotropy that you would need. And uh, the DMI would be, at the very least, at this tantalum interface. And because of the asymmetry, you naturally had the inversion symmetry breaking that you would need it to be able to stabilize the skirmion. Um, this just shows you the magnetization uh, data. What I'd like to point out is that we're very close to the reorientation transition. So uh, the material was out of plane, but um, we were very the anisotropy is uh, very low, or relatively low. Um, as an experimental technique, most of the data I'll be showing was taken with the magneto-optical care effect imaging, where, um, where we're here measuring the out of plane magnetization, so dark is in the uh, t into the surface of the board and white is out, or vice versa, whichever you prefer. Um, if we look at the film and, and change the magnetic field, what you see at high fields is that you might still have a few stripe domains. Um, when you saturate it all goes grey, but at zero field you would have, as you expected, a very thin film. Uh, just due to uh, the dipolar voyage, you would have a uh, equal balance of up and down magnetic domains. Um, the domain walls are in between in the white and the dark regions, but they're too small to resolve with this technique. I mean, Kerr microscopy has about um, 250 nanometer spatial resolution. And yes, I do have the length scale here. These striped domains here are about 5 micron, this picture. So this, the sample specifically we, we, I'm going to be talking about was essentially a, a wire <coughs> made out of this film stack. However, it wasn't just a straight wire. We uh, reduced the width in the center here by a factor of 20. So this is 60 micron, this is 3 micron, and the length of this one was 20 micron. Uh, 
Um, you also see a few leads at the top for possible hull measurements, but that's not important. So if we take this film again now in a larger field range, we, here I'm just plotting the, uh, the, the Kerr microscopy image as a function of magnetic field. So a high field, you see uh, nothing. Oh, and the other thing I'd like to point out then that these are difference images. We take the raw image and subtract the image in saturation. So in saturation, you see nothing. But then uh, you very nicely see the stripe domain show up as you, uh, sorry, this way, as you go to zero field. Around zero field, you have a nice um, balance between uh, dark and, and, and light domains. And then as you remagnetize in the opposite direction, um, you end up with only a few stripes an occasional single skirmion, and then everything's gone. <laughs> so this is expected behavior for a thin film without a plane anisotropy. What was less e expected was what happened when we applied a current going from the left to a charge current from the left to the right through this wire. And so this is a movie where this current was pulsed. So nothing is happening right now, <coughs> but when a current there's a current pulse, you'll see these streaks on both sides of the image which um, is simply because what was happening was too fast for the camera to capture. But what was noticeable after several pulses, but actually already after the first pulse, is that the image on the two sides of this constriction were different. On the left, we have the stripe domains that we also saw at the magnetic field that we'd ap applied. But after the current pulses, we see more and more objects here, circular bubbles, skirmions. We could um, apply do everything at the opposite magnetic field, which we did. So all the contrast is opposite. And again, if we send current, uh, this image was taken a little bit after a few current pulses. So we're continuing to send current pulses in the same way. And we get um, more and more skirmions on, on this side. If we now simply change the direction of the current direction, as shown in these two inner images, before the first pulse and after pulses, you see that the uh, skirmions appear on the left side. So it's not an artifact of an asymmetry in the sample. We can really uh, direct from which side we create skirmions um, by changing the current direction. And of course, there's another, there's a fourth uh, combination here of current and magnetic field direction that we explored. And uh, so this is the phase diagram, and within these arched regions is where we um, could create skirmions in this manner. And as you see, there's a, um, a critical current needed um, to be able to produce the skirmions. So if the current was too low, just uh, whatever was there was moving, but no new skirmions were created through this uh, constriction. Okay, so, so now, oh. So because those movies, uh, things were happening so fast, we applied a um, current density about a factor 10 smaller than uh, in, the, in the first mim images. And what you see here is quite uh, uh, a little bit more revealing about the process. What we're seeing is that one domain, one of these striped domains is ending up in the constriction. And then it seems that every once in a while, skirmions are being blown out <laughs> on the other end. So this helped us pin down a little bit more what the mechanism was for, for what was happening on the side, which I'll go into now. So this is again tied to what Stuart talked about this morning. If we send a, uh, a current through a, a heavy metal, we get um, the spin hall effect, which means there's a charge imbalance um, left and right and top to bottom actually. And uh, this causes a spin torque at the interface with the ferromagnet. So I've just flipped this over this way. So here, the, um, um, the ferromagnet feels a, feels a torque induced from the uh, heavy metal. And this allows domain walls to move, and this also um, allows uh, the magnetic structure to evolve in, in, in our system. And so again, this was shown by uh, Stuart this morning, that if you have now two domain walls in a chiral structure, which means the, the uh, magnetization twists in a, in a uh, continuous fashion from up to down and back to up. You have two chiral walls here opposite to each other and uh, when you now send the current through them they'll move in the same direction. So um, if we now uh, consider, this is the same plot, just sort of same concept just plotted slightly differently, let's look at one domain wall. If we now look at the stripe domain that we saw in the, the images this, this image sort of represents what's happening here at the tip. 
And if we have a continuous uh, current flowing, all we, what we would expect is for this tip to move along the current direction. Essentially, this is what you're seeing on the left side of these, uh, <coughs> these constricted wires. However, if we now take into uh, the put this constriction in there, that means that on this side, you have diverging currents in the heavy metal. That means the also the um, spin orbit torques that are here uh, are um, no longer homogeneous. And what you would get is, is that the, these, all these domain walls in, in, in the tip here of the domain would move along the current direction, which means they would be expanding. And then if, the, but the fact is they're still all coupled together, so a restoring force uh, would, should occur, which then would allow you to um, peel off a single um, spherical domain, or in other words, a skirmion. We did this with several different geometries, and it works every time you, and it doesn't depend on the width of, or not completely on the width of this uh, constriction. As long as you have these diverging currents out of the, uh, the end, you can create the skirmions. So this is, um, these are uh, before and after uh, images for two different uh, geometries. So what's key is that you have diverging currents, and then you can, um, break off skirmions off of these stripe uh, domains. Now, one of the um, things I'm, uh, you've probably noticed, and I want to point out, these, these skirmions are quite large. I mean, this is a scale bar. The ones we see in this material are micron-sized. So, of course, there was a lot, a lot of debate of, are these skirmions or are these uh, trivial bubbles? Now, trivial bubbles would have a zero topology, while skirmions should have a topology of one or zero. The fact that they all move in the same direction with the current, even when I'm, and I probably could go back for that, but the image when I didn't have too high a current density, you could see they were all moving in the same direction. Now, if we purposely create uh, topologic uh, bubbles with uh, topology of zero, something else should happen. So if we were to align the moments within the domain wall all within the plane by applying an in-plane magnetic field, then something else should happen because now these two domain walls should move in opposite directions. So either they should shrink or they should expand based um, due to the um, spin hall effect from uh, in, the, in the heavy metal. And you know, these conclusions are based on all these papers because the effective force is opposite on the two sides. So we did this experimentally. We created bubbles by playing with the magnetic field, and then, um, or, or f yes, and then f found a state, and then increased, uh, sent a current through a wire, and this was just a homogeneous wire. And you see, if you send the current in the positive direction, the bubbles disappear. <coughs> if you send it in a negative direction, they actually expand in the current direction. So these skirmions, where an in-plane magnetic field was applied instead of an out-of-plane uh, field, um, are Q is zero, topologically trivial bubbles, whereas the other ones we had created were not. And also, finally, if we apply this in-plane current to this sample geometry we were showing earlier, the same one, and um, even if we apply very high currents, we can't create the, uh, and it's in, I believe in, yeah, in this direction. Um, we can't create skirmions. All we see are the domain walls lining up with the current direction. As I said, we were interested in um, creating, uh, studying materials that could be uh, of relevance uh, for, for um, applications and um, that they might be applied to um, <coughs> base track memory applications. So we did create a uh, prototype device where now this uh, skirmia, this device that I showed earlier here is now flipped on 90 degree. And then on this side we have a uh, another wire going. And so we initially sent current through from top to bottom and you create this sea of skirmions over here. And then by sending a current in this direction we could uh, move them. And so here are a uh, series of individual snapshots. And you can see that indeed the skirmion moves in the current direction. It moves a little bit 
less fast here where we added some uh, additional leads and uh, essentially here the current density is less because some of the current leaks out so um, the speed is less but in the regions where it's within the homogeneous part of the wire um, it moves at the at the same rate and this was done by uh, individual uh, you know short current pulses of a singular or order of magnitude we were using earlier So in the second part of my talk, I'll discuss the uh, skirmion Hall effect. I'll try to slow down a bit. <laughs> so uh, from electronic systems, we know there's something called the classical Hall effect. Uh, I think uh, we've all used it in our research by now, where if you uh, send a current through a metal and you have a magnetic field, you get uh, there is uh, the electronic charges accumulate in the in the orthogonal uh, direction and there um, so the ingredients is you have this electric charge and you um, on which a, a Lorentz force works and it's so it's the charge and the magnetic field that are two key parameters and it's linked to the velocity so since skirmions are um, charges, topological charges, it, it raises the question, should there also be a skirmion Hall effect? And as we know from Karen's nice paper <laughs> and beautiful images, <laughs> um, there should be. I mean, the, you, uh, you can write the equivalent to the Lorentz force as a mag uh, Magnus force, where now the uh, electric charge is replaced by a topological charge, and it also depends on the velocity. And um, so if, if this Q value, this integration of the magnetization moments over space is, is uh, plus or minus one, you, you have actually two different topological, so you have two tip different topological charges. And as I referred to early on, um, that really symbolizes spin out or uh, spin in on, on the sphere of uh, the skirmion. And then the final question is, is, is there also a, an equivalence there to electrons and, and, and holes? So would it behave the same way? So uh, Xi Zhang Ling in, uh, in Los Alamos started doing some uh, sim macromagnetic simulations um, using sort of the geometry that we'd been using, a constricted wire along which you send current. And in his simulations, he did show that skirmions should be here moving towards the, the top of, of the wire. However, in the images I've shown you, that's not what we saw experimentally. And um, our, our conclusion was basically um, the motion of our skirmions was, too s was so slow, um, and, uh, or uh, actually the current driving them was still slow, that they were in the creep regime. So the skirmions were not moving uh, in the steady flow, which means um, there were local pinning sites that dominated the position and the motion of the skirmions. Additionally, we realized this the geometry wasn't ideal because of uh, inhomogeneous uh, currents. And I'll show you that a, a little bit more. And, but this is more of a quantization uh, issue than an experimental one. We'd also been doing, uh, or Ola Ahanian had been working with us doing some, more, some micromagnetic simulations, again, of a, a, a narrow wire expanding into a broader wire. And he, he showed us that for relatively large current densities, um, more could be going on. So he started here a simulation with a domain wall in the middle. And after um, applying this voltage, which is the equivalent of the current uh, for this scenario, um, of 40 nanoseconds and then letting it relax, that he did obtain a single skirmion at the end. Oh, I just wanted to play that again. What he was left over in the simulation was a single skirmion. But in between, it wasn't this nice scenario of a single domain wall being pinched off and, and, and producing a, a skirmion. So this led us to believe if we really simply make a very disruptive current in this region, um, that should also be enough to uh, create a skirmion, which led us to believe we don't really need that stripe domain in the constriction to get skirmions. So instead, we uh, started with the same geometry as before, except we replaced that center part of the film with a, um, a metal contact a bridge 
which would also allow us to apply higher current densities than before. Um, so um, the advantages was, or well, one effect is then you don't get this nice striped domain, but you also don't get extra heating in this area, and you only uh, get a diverging current, and allows and requires larger currents. And so now we're sending the current from right to left, and what you can see here is that you still get skirmions created in this region where you have inhomogeneous currents that can then mo move out towards the more homogeneous part of the wire. Now if you look at this image now, we're sending higher currents through and you're seeing them sort of collect here at the bottom rather that, that, than that they go, go uh, over the whole area of uh, height of this, this wire here on the left. So we played with this in different fashions and uh, flipping either the current direction or the topology direction by flipping the uh, direction of the magnetic field. And what you can see is the, so for the uh, skirmions where both are negative or both are, well, let's see, for the ones where they have the same sign, uh, the skirmions collect at the top, where they're opposite in sign, they uh, collect at the bottom. So this is nice to demonstrate that, yes, there is a skirmion hall effect because the skirmions are collecting on one side or other side of the device but it's not very useful for doing, uh, to determine the skirmion hall angle because the currents here are so divergent, it's hard to track what the uh, correlation between the current and the, and the deflection angle uh, is. So the next step was to look at a, a, a homogeneous wire, but out of the field of view here is where we're creating the skirmions, um, again, by a metal contact. And then here we studied the, uh, we, we, we picked a field condition where we didn't have too many skirmions, but enough. And lo and behold, we saw that they moved along a single wire, a uh, line actually, in the same direction. Um, if we flip <coughs> the, the field direction, um, we see what you would expect. So I just showed you this movie, and now if you look here, you can see that the skirmion moves uh, upward rather than downward, which would be evidence of a change in topological charge, because the current direction is the same. If you flip the topology, you would expect the opposite hull angle. And uh, this just simply shows you the position after uh, each current pulse that we imaged. And it shows that the um, velocity is quite homogeneous. The distance between the dots is quite regularly regular and also is the, the change in, in vertical position. Uh, um, well, basically vo both positions with the time. If we now reduce the current, we see something different. Here we see that they're just a bit wobbling about. They are moving along the current direction but on average they don't seem to uh, have a vertical a component to their direction. And so again here I'm just plotting the position after each current pulse and um, it's a little bit more stochastic. So from these uh, an analysis of, of images like these we were able to uh, map out an, an evolution of the uh, skirmion hall angle and velocity. So at very low current densities that I didn't show, the skirmions were, were, were uh, pinned. At slightly higher current densities we do see uh, a velocity, they're moving, but the uh, vertical direction of the, they have no vertical velocity, only along the current direction, which I'm calling x. And so the ratio of the, these values is plotted here and with a uh, inverse tangent it can be translated into a skirmion hall angle. If we go even uh, higher in current density, and you know, my first image was of one of these, but we did a whole series of current densities, we can see there's a linear dependence of the uh, skirmion hall angle um, with the current density. Now this result was actually quite surprising, because if we looked at some theoretical work, you would expect that once the skirmions are in the flow regime, they should move solely at a single um, skirmion hall angle. Because this uh, skirmion hall angle, or this ratio of the velocity, is simply determined by two terms, 
where alpha is the uh, damping at the interface, so that has to do with the um, interface properties, and that's independent of the, the current. And, and D is, in this case, a dissipative term. And that comes from the analysis of the motion of the skirmion in the teal approximation. But these two parameters should be current independent. So we were set at a puzzle. Uh, so we were uh, we were quite puzzled by this result, but then found some uh, a group in uh, Los Alamos were working on um, studying the motion of skirmions in a different way, and uh, they were using particle-based simulations to study how skirmions would move in a field of uh, pinning sites. So the black dots here are supposedly pinning sites. So uh, changes in the potential which translate into a slightly different potential at this, that location. And in blue are the different paths that the skirmions uh, could take. And what they in fact found was that as a function uh, of the... If it so what they plotted here is the, the driving force and then the skirmion hall angle. And um, depending on the degree of pinning that they have, um, at low pinning, in fact, you do have this region where there's a linear dependence of the skirmion hall angle on the, on the driving force. If they do calculations without pinning, they don't see it. You see a, a threshold, and then there should be a fixed value of the skirmion hall angle. And so it is clear that um, what we were seeing was that we have a pinning that is reducing the, um, is, is still playing a role in, in the dynamics of the skirmions. But um, so their work showed that if you um, have high enough currents, then you should actually be able to get to the disorder-free limit. Um, there's very little difference, if, if at all, once you're at high enough force, which translates into the current density. So this basically told us we needed to send yet more current through our devices. So we created a new wire, slightly smaller, which allowed, because we were limited in the voltage, we could apply across the sample. And uh, we, we went out to slightly higher current densities from about six up to uh, we're closer to eight here. And what we found is that we could now, if we're plotting the skirmion hall angle as a function of current density again, we see a threshold again, and then we see an increase, and then a saturated value, and then we did reach a saturation value. We did this actually for two different applied fields, and I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. So that's what these two curves are. Just the applied out-of-plane field is slightly different. And so we believe that the fact that we now find a, uh, um, we the skirmion hall angle has plateaued uh, implies that the flow regime for the motion of the currents is uh, reached. However, the, the and we get hall angles in the close to 30 degrees. So that's, um, yeah, the tells you about the vertical component. And, and we observe that there's a field dependence to this value. When we change the field, what's actually also happening is the domain, uh, the skirmion size is changing ever so slightly. Um, although our optical resolution is limited, uh, we could, this small change in field uh, was simultaneous with a small change of diameter where it went from uh, the higher field had a smaller diameter was 800 nanometers um, while the lower field was uh, 1100 nanometers and I'll come back to that in a minute oh. so yes so like before if we change now the current direction as I've sort of shown you in the movies but I just wanted to show we also collected the data and we can plot uh, sort of the mirror image of that leg, we can go a step further, we can change the topological charge by doing everything at negative applied fields, and we, and we get these two quadrants of this plot. So this really maps all the different combinations of charge and uh, topological charge and current direction. And in, in all cases, we get similar values for the saturation uh, skirmion hall angle. And, um, similar values for the critical value as well. So to go back a little bit into the theory, so the motion of the skirmion has been proposed to be able to be described by this Thiel equation, which has three components. 
Um, and if you uh, fill in the topological charge and work all of this out, what you would expect is this uh, velocity ratio to be just these two parameters, which I already mentioned, the damping and the dissipative tensor. Now, um, this dissipative tensor looks like this, and for an EL skirmion, it's, it's um, simplified to this equation where the two, these two components are zero and the diagonal ones are, are equal. And so if you stick in a very simple model of the, the skirmion, which would be in, in what we use because we have large skirmions, we have a, a, star, uh, a large ferromagnetic core, so the, uh, the angle of the uh, magnetic moment is, let's say, pi. Outside, the moment is flipped, so we give the angle of the magnetic moment a zero. And in between, we, we're supposing just a linear change uh, and so this is the domain wall of the skirmion. If you plug in the simple profile into these equations, what you get is this dissipative term depends, uh, simplifies quite nicely and depends on two things, where d is uh, the diameter of the skirmion and this gamma d is the domain wall width. <coughs> and what you see here is, is that for small skirmions, on which what I didn't show you, most of the micromagnetic simulations early on had been based, the skirmion is 90 degrees or close to 90 degrees. That means that for applications it wouldn't be very good because if you send the current in one direction, the skirmion actually moves orthogonal to that direction. However, if you look at the one micron size skirmions we're looking at, you would get a value that's much closer <laughs> to what we uh, saw experimentally. So although this analysis and, and you know, this uh, profile of the um, domain wall is, is very much simplified, if we, um, we can actually calculate values that are not too dissimilar to the uh, experimental values. Additionally, we also, if we plug in the change in the diameter of the uh, skirmion with the magnetic field, again, we get, get the right trend where the um, skirmion hall angle decreases as we go from a higher field with a smaller size to slightly uh, larger size um, at lower field. We, we, get, we see the same trend and even in the same uh, rough value. So let's go back to this, uh, to, to um, the classic um, hall effect. So in the classic hall effect, you would expect if you change the sign of the magnetic field that the electrons accumulate on the, uh, go from accumulating on one side to the other side. It's sort of interesting to see that that's a little bit different for skirmions now. For the skirmion Hall effect, we were able to change the topological number by changing the magnetic field also, but that also means that the, um, the charge changed, uh, well, the charge changed. But in fact, when you now send a current through, what you get is for positive fields, you get uh, skirmions of negative topology accumulating on, the, let's say, the top. Um, if you flip the sign, you flip the topology, um, you flip the direction on which they um, accumulate. But so in the case of skirmions, everything has flipped. So for the electrons, you, s you would still have like the holes at the top but they move to the bottom, but here the uh, topology of the, uh, the object has, uh, has changed as well. So that is, well, so while there's similarity with the classic Hall effect, this is one distinct uh, difference. Just to reiterate it a little bit more, we, uh, you know, that we can see this accum accumulation um, if we send these currents through, uh, if we send large enough currents through even a straight wire, we do collect them all up the bottom or at the top, depending on the sign and the topological charge. So, so far what I, I showed you was uh, the motion of the skirmion um, in the center of the wire. <coughs> However, um, the wire had a finite width to it, of course. And it turns out what we see at the edge was a little bit different. Um, although you can probably see one skirmion appear and disappear, another skirmion seems to fall, follow this oscillatory uh, path uh, along the edge. 
And so there seems to be a competition between the uh, some edge repulsive force here at the edge and um, the magnus force which would create this uh, skirmian hall effect. And these two images were actually from the same piece of, piece of wire. Um, this effect we don't understand yet because there were also some micromanian simulations that said, well, the skirmion velocity should actually be faster along the edge. This, this um, repulsive force should actually contribute to the velocity, rather but we observe that it's um, slower. So I would say there's some, uh, so some work to be done there, and uh, we look forward to doing that at some point. So I'm a little bit early, but some time for questions, I guess. <laughs> Um, what I'd like to sh say is, uh, I think we showed that uh, we were able to create skirmions from just having inhomogeneous currents here. Uh, we saw, showed a mechanism <laughs> where domain walls were pinched off creating skirmions, but once we replace the center part with a uh, metallic lead, it's just the fact that you have inhomogeneous currents um, is sufficient to create uh, skirmions. Assuming, of course, you have a material which can in which they can be stabilized. Um, we uh, showed the uh, skirmion hall effect. We showed that at very low currents, we have a linear dependence of the skirmion hall angle um, as a function of current direction. And that's presumably because there's still a lot of pinning, um, or pinning still plays a large role, which we implied that we're in the creep regime. Um, but we do we did measure a, a saturation of the skirmion hall angle, which would apply a flow regime has been reached there. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we believe that the size of the skirmion hall angle is consistent with um, what we would expect for this system with large skirmions. And my final thing was that, of course, we can change the sign of the skirmion hall angle with the sign of the um, topological charge. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and leave some movies. <laughs> Christmas is only halfway. <laughs>